<laughs> Welcome, everybody. <laughs> My name is Steven Snyder, and I'm going to be uh, teaching tonight. Um, I want to say thanks to Rick for inviting me. I always appreciate being with your group. Uh, I'll give you a little bit of background on me, and then I'll give a very short talk, and we'll do a meditation. Uh, I started meditating in 1976. I started in the Zen tradition actively and full time and uh, continue to practice in the Zen tradition. I also have practiced uh, about 20 years in the Theravadan Buddhist lineage as well, or practices as well, and dabbled in Tibetan Buddhism and uh, spent some years with the Diamond Heart folks. So I've done the usual uh, you know, sampling as we, uh, as we do here. Uh, anyway, I'm authorized to teach both in the Theravadan tradition uh, by Paul Sidow, and I'm also authorized to teach in the Zen lineage. I'm a Zen teacher in the Maizumi Roshi, Glassman Roshi lineage. So a lot of my teaching is a sort of a blending, a hybrid of Zen and Theravadan practices. I feel like I've sort of taken what I think is really superb about each and put them together in a way that's quite useful. Um, anyway, so tonight I'm going to be talking about the source of the universe, what we call the absolute in Buddhism. And it's called the absolute because it's viewed as being the absolute truth and absolute reality. It's the source, <clears throat> excuse me, it's the source of all creation in uh, the universe. All of us, uh, everything that we can make contact with is a product of the absolute. And experientially, the absolute has two functions. The core function is uh, what I call the unmanifest. And the unmanifest is characterized by a quality of absence, what traditionally is called emptiness in Buddhism, where there's, there's seemingly nothing there, but yet there's something there. So it's a little bit of a conundrum or paradox. And the, in the unmanifest, some of the chief qualities in addition to absence are, are peace and silence. And those actually are the force behind uh, all of life. The other function of the absolute I call the manifest, and that's characterized by presence, where the unmanifest main ch uh, chief feature is absence or emptiness. In the manifest side, it's presence, so it's here-ness, it's a substantiality, and coupled with that is pure love. So it's an unconditioned universal love that is, um, again, the presence and absence powered by the unmanifest is what creates all of life. That's the life force we all have. And in, uh, in the, let's say the Christian religion or perspective, then we'd be talking about God uh, when we talk about the absolute. One of the uh, main experiences, the cornerstone experiences of Ther Theravadan Buddhism is the uh, experience of cessation. And that occurs when our awareness and consciousness enter into the unmanifest and are drawn deeper into the unmanifest to the, the extent that all thoughts stop, all sense of uh, a self, all sense of a body stop, uh, all awareness and consciousness stop. So it's what I call a lights out experience. And the difference between cessation and sleep, normal sleep, is that cessation is dreamless. And also when we come out of cessation, when awareness and consciousness restart, there's really a kind of uh, superb clarity and this refreshed feeling that we have. It's kind of like we've left our house and come back and we've seen some of the furniture has been moved. So within our inner experience, things have changed. And in the Theravadan model of awakening, the map of awakening, this would be the first experience of cessation would be the first stage of awakening called stream entry. When I introduced myself, I forgot to mention the books I've written. Uh, so if I can just mention those briefly. The first book I wrote is on uh, deep concentration practice in the Theravadan tradition called Practicing the Jhanas. 
that came out in 2009. And then I've written a book called Buddha's Heart, which is presenting the ancient Buddhist heart practices, but from the perspective of the heart practices being qualities of the absolute uh, qualities of our true nature. So it's a little different orientation. And then my most recent book is called Demystifying Awakening, where I talk about the practices that lead to awakening, what awakening is, the different levels of awakening and embodiment and more. So if those are of interest, they're, of course, on Amazon. And I wanted to just uh, mention briefly that the cornerstone of Buddhism is the Buddha's enlightenment, his awakening. And all of Buddhism is built upon that cornerstone. And for me, what an awakening is, is it's the absolute realizing, waking up to itself in a particular location. So this is a particular location. The absolute awakens here, there's awakening in this consciousness. And for there to be an awakening, or for me as a teacher to confirm an awakening, there has to be three components. The first is a deep experience of what I call absence of self. And absence of self is what we might call emptiness or, or no self. And it's a, the, the felt sense of that is right now, if I asked you who you were, you would turn in and you would make contact with something that's familiar and then would communicate to me, I'm, I may be this person, I may live in this place, I may have these likes and dislikes, all of this. But when we're with absence of self, we don't have an answer. We don't know who we are. Literally, we wake up in the morning and I have no idea who I am. And that continues for sometimes weeks and months. So if that were to happen, then let that be. Let it, let it be there. There's a lot of pull by the personality to want to assert your likes and dislikes and establish a self again but it's really skillful to stay with the absence of self when it's present. Another component for awakening is seeing clearly one's true nature. So it's not just seeing the absolute, it's recognizing the absolute is our true identity. So that's a big shift. And then finally, there needs to be a thoroughgoing love experience, a unity experience of everything is the same fabric of oneness all is one, and that must include us. So it can't be that I'm perceiving the world and everything around me is love and I'm not included. So it needs to be thoroughgoing in that way. And in the Zen tradition, they'll talk about the depth of awakening. And that really relates to how long the experience of awakening lasts. It can last seconds, it can be very, very brief and quick, and it can go uh, longer, it can be days, weeks, even months. And so the longer it goes, that longer that shift in who we are changes. And um, if it's a deep enough awakening, true nature becomes the foundation rather than the personality. And we learn have to learn how to function from that. So the main question I get at this point is why isn't everyone awake? If this is so clear what's, what's to happen, and the main resistance is that firm conviction in the customary self-identity, who we take ourselves to be at our core. We have beliefs and we have what I call core conceptual convictions. And these are convictions, these are concepts that we hold so dear, we don't ever question or challenge them. So things like gravity would be a uh, not obviously it's not a personal quality, but it's a kind of conviction. We don't question it's it's uh, a certainty. And in the same way, we hold opinions about ourselves in the world with that same level of certainty. And those really are what get get in the way of awakening because we we believe them so deeply. So as we have more contact with the absolute, it softens our allegiance 
to those core convictions and lets us begin to question them. And that loosens and opens us up to where we can then recognize and receive the absolute. Because the absolute needs our form. It can't awaken except through form. So that's why we're needed for the absolute to awaken to itself here. So I'm going to go ahead and, and stop here and start taking some questions or comments. And feel free to either share your experience or if you want have a question for me, I'm happy to receive those. Good Hi, afternoon. Farrah. Good evening. Uh, thank you so much. It was such a profound uh, meditation and you're just amazing. And uh, my question is uh, uh, basically two questions. One is uh, how can I, uh, it just doesn't make sense because in one area, which is my trough area, close mm -hmm. to my heart, I have a huge closeness, mm -hmm. which is, uh, I know it's come from the past trauma, which yep. is so much believed that I don't deserve it. I'm not lovable. Right. And, right. Uh, and for some reason, I cannot make the shift. Mm -hmm. The upper area, which is my brain, because I work so much, it's amazing, right? Mm -hmm. So I was fully able to follow your direction. And I've been uh, following Moji's directions. And it's amazing, right? Mm -hmm. I right. can really get to that place. For that, uh, you know, uh, discrepancy within me. Mm -hmm. And I'm just questioning, if I'm able to get to that place, how I can dissolve that part within me or within that place. Yep. But as yep. much as I go through that deeper, it become harder. Right. That's one question. And another one. Well, let me, have... let me, let me answer that one first. I, I won't be able to hold them all. <laughs> but Thank you. It's, it's a great question. And, and during the meditation, where, where were you feeling contact with the absolute? Oh, in my brain, in my heart. Okay, in every my place belly, but, but the neck. But the neck. Okay, so, so what you do when you make contact like that is you feel the presence, either the absence of the presence in the head and in the body, and you also feel the tightness in the neck too. Mm -hmm. But you don't do anything. You let them interact however they're going to. You don't have to do anything and they will begin to communicate at some point, and that will start a softening. And some of it's gonna be, I mean, you'll probably have to do some work around it, some investigation. You seem to know what the co content is of that, you know, at least the history of it. And so yes. there may be some work you'll have to do to release it or to be with whatever the underlying trauma was that started that. But there's something probably around, um, you know, normally in the throat, it's something about speech, mm -hmm. uh, saying something, saying the right thing, you know, something along those lines. But but the main thing is just just be with all of it and let it let it interact. Uh, so my other question is exactly what you said about attachment, right? Mm -hmm. So, for example, when you did such a beautiful meditation, I truly appreciate that love meditation. I try to just stay there, right? Mm -hmm. But then, but then mind comes in and just saying it, but remember, do not have to attach. So let it go, let it move on. But at the same time, when I was just focusing on here, that the feeling of pleasant, feeling of uh, kind of joy, but at the same time, something interfered that don't forget about the attachment. Don't attach here, Yeah. just move on. But so I'm just so confused. Don't know, should I have to stay there, listen to the feeling that is creating in me? Mm -hmm. Or should I just mentally believe that I shouldn't attach? Well, I, I, again, I, I think the, the strategy is to be with the absolute, to be with the tightness in your throat without investigating it. Just, you know, like we're together right now, just like this. And then over time, they start communicating and they start working it out. And again, then it'll reveal whether you have any work to do on your side or whether this is just a, uh, a tension, you know, a holding 
of a pattern. And then you'll see what comes next, how to unfold it. So, so it, stay there. When I stay there, it doesn't mean that I attach to that. No. Okay, no. thank you so much. That yeah. was my confusion. Okay, okay, great. That's Thanks for your questions. Thank you. Hi, Stephen. Hi. Thank, thank you, you so Rick. much for this evening's presentation or meditation, not presentation. Well, actually both. Uh, I really appreciated your talk both before and afterwards. And my question is, I, I think, pretty simple. It, it is that um, it's simply that when um, a meditation feels particularly profound, I feel like I want to continue um, with that experience. Mm -hmm. But then, you know, there's stuff to do. So how do you... How do you reconcile that? I mean, because we have this break and I'm sure, you know, most people are going to go off and, you know, get a cup of tea or something. And I just didn't want to do that. I just wanted to abide in, in this kind of sense of presence. Yeah. Yeah. And, and um, what do you recommend? Well, um, I've got a couple of uh, videos on YouTube where I uh, guide people through the same same territory and, and just know that every one of the videos is different because I'm I, I'm commenting in real time what's what's appearing. So uh, they're not identical uh, in any stretch. And there's one I did that's just in the un, un, into the man, unmanifest, the peacefulness that's on Guru Viking. It's called Absolute Peace Meditation. And it's about 45 minutes and folks have uh, downloaded it. You can listen or watch it. And that's another way I, I recommend doing it before bed because it's a great way to just really relax and really move into that territory of peacefulness before we sleep. And I think, you know, my unofficial theory is it might be helpful to um, land in our subconscious. Yeah. I'm sorry. What's it called again? Uh, Absolute Peace Meditation. And it's on the Guru Viking website. <clears throat> okay. And then you can you can find stuff on YouTube under my name. There's a bunch of videos. Sure. Okay. Well, thank you very much. You're again. welcome. Really You're welcome. Hi. Um, thank you as well for tonight's session and the meditation. It was lovely. Uh, I have a question on how does the feeling of bliss relate to awakening? I've had moments where I've just felt so you know, peaceful, relaxed, connected to oneness. And, mm -hmm. uh, and I describe those or define them as bliss. So how would mm -hmm. it relate to the absolute that we were meditating on this evening? Yeah, I think in either contacting the unmanifest or manifest, we can encounter bliss, which is really a form of the love. It's a form of the peace and stillness. It's just a kind of ecstatic experience by connecting. And I think also that we know on some level when we're connecting with the absolute that we're connecting with the source. And even that is really a happy time, which I think folks do experience. Some experiences, but it's not everyone, but it's not uncommon. And, and those moments, um, I found they don't last for long, like they last five minutes, let's say, is that mm -hmm. Is that a beginning to being able to practice it more? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. It's okay. it's where you start, and and it's important not to not to regret when it goes away. To just know it has its own timing, and it's going to appear and then go when it's it's the right time. So we, you know, you you know, you're not making it. You're not making it happen. So you can't control when it stops or goes away or goes out of view. So just just be patient and. And enjoy the times when it's there. Try and really surrender to it, open to it, let it touch anywhere in your consciousness is very important because that lets it land more fully in your consciousness. Thank yeah. you. You're welcome. Um, so my question maybe is a little more nuts and bolts. Um, when when you were leading us through the meditation, and we got to the point. Uh, where you were encouraging us to contact the manifest mm -hmm. and visualizing that as as light okay so i'm i'm meditating with my eyes closed mm -hmm. and when you first mentioned light 
I'm I'm not my eyes are not taking in any light. Mm -hmm. um, I'm thinking of other visualizations that I've been led through where you imagine a light streaming in, but I'm not sure if imagination that, that didn't seem authentic. Um, so my question is where where is this light and how how are you perceiving it? Um, I can't say where the light is. I don't know the answer to that. Um, but it's just it's in in consciousness. So when I'm there, I'm I'm describing for you what's happening in, in my consciousness and which is in our field. So that's why a number of you can make contact with that because it's already in our field. I, I'm not doing anything. I'm not making this happen. I, I'm simply reporting to you step by step what's unfolding. So it's in real time. So when you're making this switch then from from sitting with the unmanifest to sitting with the manifest, mm -hmm. how are you making that switch? What the light the light starts. So it just flows. It's not something that's happening in your head. No, there's no technique to it. Just I'll I'll be there, and, and I, I'm a I'm a visual meditator, so I see. So I'm seeing the deep blackness, and then all of a sudden, like rays of light start coming across from my peripheral vision, and so I recognize, and I start reporting on the light, and that ends up, you know, where where we move into the manifest over time. Do other things like is there sound that is connected with the manifest or other Do, sensations or is it just light? Yeah, there there's more because the the light really the bright fluffy white is really a combination of pure presence and pure love, and those can be differentiated. The pure love differentiates into qualities like the Brahma Viharas, um, equanimity. Um, empathetic joy, compassion, and and loving kindness or unconditioned love, so it differentiates into those qualities and more. There's there's a number of qualities of true nature, um, so but but that's where it all differentiates from, is from the it's powered by the unmanifest, the absence powers everything, and then the presence and love is what manifests everything. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, you said something that I found really quite intriguing. You said that the absolute needs form to awaken. Mm -hmm. and it reminded me of a book I read probably in the 1980s. Um, it was a Jungian who wrote it, a guy called Edward Ettinger or something like that. Okay. And the, in the title, it was the word was it was the word consciousness and something else, but I can't remember. And I'll just use the word God, because he uses the word God, and I've, you know, God is like the manifest and the unmanifest, and this is the whole shebang. And mm -hmm. it's not a he, it's an it, it or of anything. Right, right. And um, he said that God can only know itself through us, mm -hmm. that it can only become conscious of itself through us. Is that similar to the absolute needs form to awaken? Well, it's in my contact with the absolute, I, I would say that it, it is awake and there is a knowing quality there. It's a different kind of knowing. It's a direct knowing. Like if we touch water, we know whether it's hot or cold. You know, we know by the direct contact. But, but for the, w the way it works is, is form is created so that the absolute can awaken in consciousness. It can awaken in the world. And that's that's how the system is sort of set up. I can't say it's designed that way. I don't know any about that, but but it does seem to need uh, us in order to do that to to awaken to itself in form. It's already it's already awakened, not in form. So we could say in formlessness. Okay. So is it kind of is it is it something like, and this is not the right word, but I don't know another word. Is it something like an animating? Yeah, um, it's the an life force. Animating force, force. yeah. And yeah, so it's like, the life force in each of us. So like you like and and you said that it needs form to awaken. Well, rocks have form. 
-hmm. So, but then there are people who say that that rocks are even alive. Yeah. That everything yeah. is alive. That is that is infused with a spirit. So. Right. Okay. Well, it's it, the way Buddhism looks at that is, is that uh, these different um, objects, including animals, can all have their own kind of awakening, but it's different than a human awakening, because we have a we have a frontal lobe, we have a sense of personality, and we take all that to be true. So until we we can step outside that and open up to what's you know what's animating all this, which, as you said, is the presence and and the absence, that then we can have that experience here and, and ultimately be a functioning arm of the absolute. If we're like, awake enough. The hands, the hands that do God's work. The hands, thing. right, exactly. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Can you hear me? Yes. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay, okay. Um, I had something happen to me 30 some years ago it, it was and I didn't know what it was and somebody labeled it and they called it a kundalini awakening mm -hmm. and it was hell mm -hmm. um and uh I thought I was gonna die yeah for about 10 months yeah um and then <clears throat> I feel like the rest of my life has been spent adjusting to it mm -hmm. and when I first read about it I thought oh goody this is um enlightenment or you know something mm -hmm. really cool it wasn't cool it yeah. was just bloody hard um so what's happened since then in maybe the last even just couple of years is i a couple of things have happened one is i've noticed that when somebody even talks about the galaxies or the heavens i i don't know what it is there's just something so there's not a word for it. I guess awe is the only word. Right. Yeah. Right. Um, and the other thing I've noticed too, and I feel so completely detached from this, is interestingly enough, the previous person mentioned hands. Like I was at my dentist the other day, and she's actually a friend. So she's mm -hmm. going to extract this tooth. <laughs> and she says, um, she says, and I've decided I'm going to do it in spite of the the trouble i'm having with my hands and she's like in her 40s and i said what's wrong with your hands she says i've got something called soren's disease hmm. and my hands are really stiff and i don't do extractions but i know you would like me to do it and i was compelled to hold her hands mm -hmm. and it, and i was i didn't even know why you know i i just held her hands and i feel that a lot of times that anyway so then i texted her afterwards and i said I didn't mean to be inappropriate, you know, like I just, I feel this sometimes, but I don't do anything with it. And then she texted me back and she said, she said, I just felt love. And Good. I, but, but the weird part is, is that I, I struggle with so many things and it's sort of like this, I kind of have two lives. Like, and I, when something like that happens it's not me doing it i don't i right. don't feel ownership of it i feel like it's just kind of bizarre actually but it's not bad it's just conduit or something yeah i, I don't know I, I guess my question would be when i didn't even ask a question but and i think i know the answer but how can i have more of that right <laughs> less <laughs> of the, the, the crap, the mm -hmm. hard stuff. Yeah. Well, in, in the, in the traditional awakening experience in Buddhism, it's not something that's born of pain be, because we're waking up to that pure love. We're waking up to that pure peacefulness, the presence, all of that. So it's a, it's a liberating and really, um, I could say with a small e ecstatic experience. And, and then after awakening is some of what you're describing, that there's a period of integration, a period of learning how to let it inhabit who you are and influence who you are. And we really have to look at life through the lens of truth. What's true in your life and what's not, whatever's not true mm. needs to be released. And so you're, you're basically your outside has to match your inside. They don't. Um, yeah. But the more they do, 
the the easier it is and then that lets us go deeper in meditation because we're in effect walking our talk so that's why it's why it's a good thing to do yeah but i think if you weren't if the meditation but i mentioned about the the guru viking absolute peace meditation yes I wrote that's that one down. good yeah so you could watch that and okay. i think that would also be something that would be useful for you to listen to i think the other thing i found like i'm fairly new to this style of meditation. I used to be mm -hmm. part of a church and we did it, but I've been sort of part of Tara Brack's group and stuff for about a year and a bit. Uh -huh. And I think what I found is that to have space so that the other can happen. Because if mm -hmm. I'm so caught up in something that I'm upset about or obsessing about or whatever, there isn't space for the other to happen. Right, in inner spaciousness is critical. Mm. And and that's part of what we're cultivating in meditation is more and more of that spaciousness because really it's the it's like the canvas upon which realization is painted to use a metaphor. Mm -hmm. But but you're quite right, the inner spaciousness is very critical. So if we're crowded out by a lot of our personality workings, and we have to get to where we have more silence and that will calm down the personality where we can have more open space. But I'm running out of time. <laughs> Only Thank takes you. a minute. <laughs> no, I mean, I'm getting pretty old. It's like, uh-oh. I know. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. Hello, Stephen, and thank you, Stephen, for welcome. this evening. Um, something that I uh, personally have some challenges with, but I, not so much this evening, but I noticed it was coming up in the chat. So I thought I would raise it, um, even though right at the moment it's not quite as um uh as uh strong for me mm -hmm. uh but that is the um in a classic phrasing um more classic phrasing equanimity with don't know mind and mm -hmm. how do you um perhaps at this phase or maybe at some other point in your life uh, did you cultivate um, that sense of okayness with don't, I really don't get what's going on. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I thought I would just phrase that. Thank you. Yeah, I, I think there is a way that we do have to understand that the absolute is a mystery. And it's a mystery we're never going to fully penetrate. We're never going to get to all of it. So the, the realizations are endless as is, it seems, the personal material. And both of those seem to be ongoing. But the okayness comes more and more as we begin realizing having little awakenings, they're called Kensho in, in Zen. But as we have these little Kensho experiences and we see true nature, then we begin to start shifting over to true nature as our foundation. And then when there's a larger awakening that I, I use the term satori for that when it's more it seems to be more than 51 percent of consciousness if that wakes up then the personality is is uh moved out of the way as from the foundation and true nature becomes the foundation so and that's we we begin again i talked about the with the last last person that the inside's got to match the or outside's got to match the inside so that's where we look at our behavior, our life choices, what we're doing, what's really reflecting who we are at our deepest level. And that reinforces and then opens us up for more experiences. Thank you, Stephen. Um, I'm reminded of um, someone else who said something similar in that um, when the this sort of broadening of the foundation is another way I might I might word what you're saying I hope yep. that's somewhat reflective yep. um, it's in a sense as if we have to teach the child again how to walk talk and mm -hmm. interact and be in the world again that challenge around equanimity when we're in a space where that's less foundation it, mm -hmm. it can be can be really challenging so i just yeah. want to acknowledge that yeah and equanimity and as, thank you that's that's it for me sure. so thank you. Uh, equanimity as i teach it is about acceptance accepting the truth of the moment because that's really why we're not equanimous is we want something to be different so that's where if we're just paying attention to accepting what's right here right now that's really one of the secrets 
Thanks for your questions. I'm just so taken with this business about um, the unmanifest and the manifest and knowing itself. And, and you said that can show experiences like little, sort of like little awakenings and gathering allow us to see some of our true nature. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if, like you said that the unmanifest knows, mm -hmm. but it's a different kind of a knowing. And then you said that, that in terms of creation on this planet, that it's humans that have, you know, we've got the more, the more evolved brains, mm -hmm. but I'm wondering if there's something to do with the self-reflective quality that we humans have, if we choose yep. to use it. Cause I know a lot of people who don't reflect their self right. about themselves at all. Um, and so I wonder if maybe the, that knowing of the unmanifest is like maybe what's, what's needed through us is is like having something mirrored back to it mm -hmm. or like a self-reflection and and you said that the inside and the outside need to match i i know i'm not i don't have this all sorted clear in my mind how i'm asking this but but i'm also really fascinated with the true nature like is our true nature akin to the greater, um, the greater knowing, or, or is it is it when we when we get connected to our own true nature, are we offering a greater self reflection to the greater on the outside? And like, I'm thinking also, yeah. I, I could pause here and you can say something, but I wanna say something else about Chinese philosophy mm -hmm. that fits here. Yeah, I, th I think you're exactly right. It's the self-reflective capability of humans that allows us to awaken. Although it's believed in Buddhism that animals can awaken, but in their own way. So, um, but anyway, that's another topic. But the self-reflection in awakening, it is a self-reflection, but what happens is, um, and true nature simply means the absolute in your consciousness. It's just because there is a, uh, a way we have, we have a collective and we also have an individual or perceive an individual consciousness. So it's when the absolute self-reflects, awakens to itself in the location of Ramona. Okay. Oh, so that's that, cool. Yep. Now, in Chinese Buddhism, mm -hmm. a long, long time ago, mm -hmm. um, they had an expression. I'm, I'm just looking at my wall because it's on my wall, the, a Chinese uh -huh. wall hanging. And it's Ming Xin Jian Xing. And what it means is, literally, it means bright heart, um, see true character or see true nature. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so... And it's been explained to me by Chinese people that what it means is, and there's so many different ways to say it, that when we can see clearly into our own hearts, into our own depths, then we will know ourselves and we will know our destiny. Okay. Or something like that. And so <clears throat> I guess that that's just sort of a part of all of this that we're talking about. Right. We're, we're seeing into our heart. Seeing into the heart of the absolute is seeing into the the pure love, the differentiated qualities of of love, of compassion, of equanimity, of empathetic joy, and more. So, so those are pure qualities. There, and the way we can tell when they're qualities of true nature or the absolute is that they're universal, they're objective, and when we create something. It has, I call it the fragrance of us. It's just, it feels like it's produced by Ramona, where if you're in touch with a quality of true nature, it's definitely gonna feel, you're, you're gonna say, I'm not doing this. I'm really clear, I'm not doing this, but it's yeah. here. And so that's yeah. some of the hallmarks of when we're in touch with true nature. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Stephen, so much. <clears throat> um, I'm going to struggle with this a little bit to put into words my question. Um, the, the absolute 
is also loving. And I think my question sort of has to do with we we as humans can practice um, and that practice may bear fruit in different ways and at different times for people. Um, from the absolute choice um, perspective, if, if one can say that, this, this absolute, which is filled with love, I would guess if, you know, I, <laughs> Not to speak for the absolute, but 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 it would seem as if they would want everyone to be enlightened and experiencing this. And mm -hmm. yet people can practice for years, maybe have, as you said, little Kensho experiences. And other people, my understanding is they get just get hit with this mm -hmm. and don't even know <clears throat> what has happened to them. And maybe never integrate or spend a lifetime integrating or maybe integrate that very easily um can you speak I, I don't even know what my question is but can you can you kind of speak to that I, I mean it doesn't seem as if we have a whole lot of choice other than practicing you know that's on our part we can make that decision and devote time to that but right. is there some choice from the other side or how does how does it happen that some people will, you know, go further on the path and others um, it just it's not not in this lifetime? Yeah, it's a good question. And probably that discussion would get into discussing about rebirth and past lives, because it does seem I mean, I have students who have experiences or talk about things that they can't possibly know about, they haven't had the experiences of yet. So I, I, I'm a believer in, in rebirth and past lives from seeing this, and I've had a few experiences myself. So I think that's part of the explanation. And the other is that, yes, we have to practice, and then we also have to be willing to surrender. Mm -hmm. We have to be willing to let go of who we take ourselves to be because we clutch onto that as like a raft, but we have to be willing to be without the personality and without all the psychological structures, at least temporarily. So that takes a lot of, uh, a lot of safety, a lot of feeling secure. So that's where um, on retreats, it's so important to have those qualities so that people can feel safe to put these things down and open themselves to the mystery. Uh, thank, thank you, Stephen. I think just, just one more comment, which really interesting is as human beings, we need to have that, that as, you, as you said, and I think Ramon also said, the self-reflective mm -hmm. power, and yet it seems as if we need to lose that. Or maybe well, maybe the definition is not what I'm thinking of in terms of self-reflecting. It's almost as if you have to let go of that at some point to to like make that final step. Yeah, there's a switch where we start off self-reflecting, and by self we mean the psychological structures. And at some point those start getting more transparent mm -hmm. and thinner, and then the reflection begins to be of true nature or the absolute reflecting upon itself. And that's what begins our, our journey into the world of awakening. Thank you. You're welcome. Well, thanks everyone. I appreciate your spending this time with me and I wish you well on your practice in life and look forward to next time we practice together. Bye now.